led by a boy leader outside the church, elected inside the church, selected. The patrol leaders represent their young men, kind of like a congressman, at the, at the monthly troop leaders council to, to their wishes and their needs, and then they report back to them. Patrol leaders lead with adult shadow leadership. And that's essentially what the patrol leadership is. This A is advancement. Yeah, this is one. This is one of eight methods. What I see too often, if I were to put the font by the emphasis, it'd be this. A. Advancement is everything. And it, and it, and it drowns out everything else we do. And I'm not, I'm not being facetious here. This is this is what I this is what I know this when I go around the country. Okay, so let's get away from that. So this is U for uniform. L is leadership. The S is the scouting ideals. And that's the model, the oath, the code, the slogan. Our young men should know that. They should live by it. It should be part of everything that we do. This is the outdoors. I think our most powerful method. And here we are in beautiful Utah. All this wonderful, I mean, from my home in Linden, about six miles from my house, a sign that says Mount Timpanogos Wilderness Area. I mean, I've just never lived in a place with that kind of options. And, and no, nothing, no uh, vehicles allowed, and there's elk and deer. I mean, it's just amazing. I lived in Texas, and it wasn't quite the same. And it was, it was, it was tougher. I think we take it for granted sometimes. The outdoors, let me share with you a little story here that helps illustrate that. This is from Elder Hill. Elder Harold Hillow tells a story that demonstrates the attitude we should have toward outdoor activities when they're done for the right reasons. I recall a conversation I had some years ago with my state president in Idaho. We were discussing the forthcoming Iranian priesthood scout campout. I explained to him that it would be necessary for each person to bring his own sleeping bag, to which the president replied, quote, I've never slept in a sleeping bag. I quickly responded to the president, you can't be serious. You've been living in Idaho all these years. You've never slept in a sleeping bag? No, he said, I never have, but I sure laid it. <laughs> I can relate to it. And they went on to say, and I'll lie on a whole bunch more of them if it will save for us. Every time I read that, my mind goes to a snow camping trip I had with my son in Oregon. If you've been to Western Oregon in the winter, they have the they spare Utah most of the snow. They get the snow there, heavy wet snow, 20 feet high up in the mountains. So we go up and we dig a hole. And the big snow drift and the snow and build a snow cave. Well, it was snowing hard and we were in a hurry and we didn't dig it very deep. And I'm laying there in the snow cave. I'm warm. It was about eight inches from my nose to the top of the cave, right? If I roll over on my shoulder, I barely touch the top of the cave. And it's like five o'clock at night, it's dark, and I know I'm sentenced there until like six o'clock. <laughs> and then my mind starts to race. I could be home. And then, you know, and then my, my son is having a blast. He's in a cave with his dad for the first time in the And at the time, I was thinking, well, why, why did I volunteer to go on this camping trip? I could be home and doing all this other stuff. Knowing what I know now, uh, first of all, I dig a deeper cave. You don't have to, you know, create the things more upon you, but I would do more of those with my children. And it's priceless, the time that we spend with them. And if we use the outdoors for spiritual purposes, it can be magical. Outdoors. This is Adult Association, second day, which is the merit badge program, okay? which again is magic, the way it's supposed to be done. Here's the way it's supposed to be done. A young man decides he wants to work on a merit badge. He has a merit badge counselor. Uh, the scoutmaster gives him a blue card. You still have blue cards? Signed by the scoutmaster that says, you have my permission to serve this merit badge. The young boy picks up the phone, not the mom, and calls the merit badge counselor. Now, we can't do one-on-one -on -one anymore, but two boys there or other people watching, the young man goes to see the merit badge counselor maybe one or two or three times and earns the merit badge. The merit badge counselor signs off the last requirement. The young man brings that blue card to the next troop meeting at which he's awarded that merit badge in the troop meeting. And then three months later, at a court of honor, he's awarded, he's recognized in front of his peers with the card. Merit badge is already on his sash. Is that how we're doing it? Most of us not. The process isn't as important to me as to what happens with those three visits with that merit badge. 
what happened to me, the athletic merit badge, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think about this as a kid. I wanted to work on the athletic merit badge because it had this purple thing with this red, like almost like a Nike shoe with flames. It wasn't even required, but I wanted to earn that merit badge. So my scoutmaster signed it off. I went and saw Brother Dixon, who happened to be a member of our board, who I didn't know very well. And back then it was one-on-one, -on -one, but it could have been two of us. And for three times, I had my merit badge in with me. My mom dropped me off to Brother Dixon's house. And he worked with me in 50-yard dash and the push-ups and sit-ups. He talked about his mission. And after those three times, I got the merit badge. But what happened during those conversations with Brother Dixon, looking back, and I can see it, <coughs> is the fire of a mission was inserted in my heart. My dad was not a return missionary. He was an open novel at age 18. Brother Dixon had this fire that I had never, never experienced before. Adult association. Now, we send kids off to, up to summer camp, and that's OK. But too often, we, we, uh, the system is really uh, not done very well. My, here, here's, a, here's an example of not my, my oldest son in Colorado <coughs> went to Mutual one night. Came back to Mutual. I was home and he said, Dad, I earned the woodworking merit badge. I said, great. I didn't know you were working on the woodworking merit badge. He said, I didn't either until I got to Mutual. We were there, and there was this table with these partially done woodworking projects, and we hammered a few things in, and it had a little lecture, and they signed off for that. Now, that's not the purpose of the woodworking merit badge or any merit badge. In our zeal to get to ego, we take shortcuts, and it, and it doesn't help us. It doesn't help us at all. It doesn't help us <coughs> at We don't want to make things more difficult than they should be. We use the process, this inspired, divine process, the way it was designed. I think we can do better. We can use merit badge counselors in a way to help make sure that the right people are meeting with the right young men to be second and third witnesses to people who believe in Christ and serve Christ. So that's personal growth is the last one. That's service projects and the scoutmasters uh, meeting with each boy each level of the base. Okay, control method, advancement, uniform leadership, scoutmaster fields, outdoors, adult association, personal growth. With varsity, this is a squad instead of a patrol. The varsity has all kinds of other things, and I hope you don't think it's just you know one letter off the Boy Scouts. Varsity is a wonderful thing. How many of you have ever done on target? How many of you have never heard of on target? Oh my goodness. You know, on target was created like 1973 in Utah. This it's all in hard times. Uh, young men. Three months out, go and build this three by two foot mirror. And they practice in this mirror using kind of compass coordinates. They get people with radios. They each pick a peak. We did this in Texas. We did this in California, where there was fewer peaks. They each pick a peak, and on a designated day at 9 o'clock Saturday morning, as they hike to the top of the peak of their mirror, they take, they, they take the sun from the east, and they try to get a beam of light to another peak. And I. I did this in California at Mount Tamalpais, which is just by the Golden Gate Bridge, because the bridge was fogged in. We were on top of Mount Tamalpais, which is like 3,000 feet. The ocean was over here. And Mount Diablo was about 40 miles away. Through the mist, you barely see it. And we were talking to the people with their ham radios. We were doing our little thing. And suddenly, this beam of light comes out of the, the fog from, from Mount Diablo. We're all yelling and screaming. They can see our yelling and screaming. And then they went to get across the California Valley to the highest building in Sacramento and up the foothills to Mount Rose outside of, uh, outside of Green. Now, what do you do if you climb the top of a mountain and you have this, uh, this big thing with you, this mirror, testimony meeting, you lay down and put a little thing in the ground and you bury yours and pick it up the next year. Some of those spiritual experiences the Varsity Scouts have is to a You need to re-energize re that area. Well, places where you have on target is you can tear from you. The sun shines most of the time. We have lots of mountains. It's a great experience with experience. Uh, that's varsity. Adventure, which is the preschool. This is adult association. I've used it as a theme working with priests. Never do for a young man what he can do for himself. Think about it. What can a young man do if properly asked and trained and do just about anything? <coughs> let, let them lead. This is uh, leadership, recognition. There are some awards to set the bench but we've learned that young men aren't that excited of using other words. They've got to be able to fight at that point. 
So it's still be recommended. This is ideals. The venture side, venture salute. They put the right arm to the square. They promise their duty to God. I think that's significant. What they do later. Group activities. And I would suggest as many activities with the laurels as possible. To me, our return missionaries come home from their mission and they have no clue how to deal with the opposite sex. I see the BYU all the time. I don't know why. I guess because they were so careful before their mission. They know no dating, nothing. Now, mission, they get back and suddenly they're supposed to get married and they're, they're, they're way down. This is high adventure. By high adventure, it doesn't have to be dangerous, but it should be challenging. And this is teaching others. Venture is created with all the manuals and all the works that we keep and you've learned of. We want our young men to be teachers and missionaries. So it's a great tool from the age of 16 to 18. It's a priest form today. It should be a mission prep class. I don't know how old you are. And I've heard people say, well, now with the newest announcement from President Monson, we're not going to do venturing. We're going to do mission prep. I'm like, what do you do? I mean, anything you do on Wednesday night is venturing because it's, it's boy-led and adult, and adult watching. So people think that there's some venturing program that we don't know what it is, but we're not going to do it. And we're, you know, we're going to do mission prep. Well, everything you do is mission prep. The boys will help do that. You will create it. Venturing is a program that's very flexible, and you can make it happen. Those are the methodologies to achieve the aims. Now, this is something I just added today. The scout kit. I had a guy, a BYU professor, in my office three days ago. He met me three months ago, and I suggested to him, he was saying, it's difficult for us to run a mutual program because they put us in the corner, the Boy Scouts, and we can hear the basketball bouncing, and we can hear the beehives in the hall. I mean, think about it. We're the two greatest distractions you could possibly face in front of a young man. <laughs> right? And we think we have to stay in the building the whole time. So I said, leave the building. Have opening exercises and go to scouting somewhere else. That's how the Baptists do it successfully. They that girls love they're doing it. They're basketball hoops. So he went prison from his wife. There's a separate entrance to his unfinished basement. And he read a little thing in my book about the easy chair in the 1915 scout handbook that says a scoutmaster at the troop meeting should have an easy chair. Seriously, where you sit in your easy chair and the senior patrol leader I have wood badge, where I've been wood badge, the scoutmaster has an easy chair. I was a senior I worked my tail off. And the scoutmaster, he wasn't, it, it's something he'd be lazy. He had already trained me. He was there just to be sure we hear each other. So he and the assistant scoutmaster sit in those two chairs while the senior patrol leader runs the show. They have a tent up all the time. They've got stuff on here, the flags that are posted. He's got six daughters, no sons. And he said, I need, I need a place for the men to hang. It's called the scout camp. And it's separate entrance. So on a Sunday, he stood at the priest meeting and said, Brother, for the next eight to ten months, however I'm a, I'm a leader, we're gonna, the boys are going to meet in the scout cave. Since that happened, high priests have driven up to his house and saying, show me the scout cave. <laughs> and they looked in the scout cave. Some of the high priests are donating stuff to help build the scout cave. Can we do this? And he lived across the street from the church. When I was in Oregon, where we don't have as many members, I encouraged them to do the same thing, and the scoutmaster, after opening exercises, took the boys across the street to an elementary school with a arrangement from the school district. They had their own room, their own stuff. Uh, in, in Philomath, Oregon, the guy had a heated barn. That's where they had their troop camp. Just a suggestion. It's very hard to run a scouting program on mutual night. In Texas, mutual night was Wednesday night because they have a, a, a rule there that all church activities have to be on Wednesday night. No school activities were registered. So we were there with two wards. So there was 12 groups competing for space in our building. So we said, well, we're going to get out of the building. And it worked. Just a suggestion. Every combined activity, every activity night, every camping trip should be planned with the goal of bringing young men closer to Christ. This can be accomplished by careful planning, by conducting a reflection. So let's talk about reflection. Or that we'll do this. On the other hand, an unstructured, casual approach, focus on programs <coughs> instead of people, a focus on checking out boxes instead of feeding their spirits, 
and contribute to the spiritually growing of man. That's kind of sad. Okay, let's talk about reflections. We didn't make this up. Boy Scouts have adopted this from some educators in Minnesota, but we've, we've kind of changed the name. And it's simply a discussion that you have at the end of an activity. Every mutual night, potentially, at the end of a camping trip or several times on a camping trip, you stop and you reflect. Here's the rules of a reflection. I suggest you write this down. You do it immediately. So if you're on a camping trip or a mutual night, you, before you leave the building, you circle up and you have a reflection. That's rule number one. Rule number two is you ask open-ended questions. Uh, Philmont puts it into three things called roses, buds, and thorns. Roses, what went well tonight? Buds, what did we learn? And thorns, how could we do this better? They're all open-ended questions. That's not the reflection, that's just getting kids warmed up. <laughs> For the third thing, we, we make rules of no cut-downs and no put-downs. Boys can be brutal to each other. So you say whatever, you can say whatever you want in this conversation, then you need to train yourself as a facilitator to not show nonverbal disapproval. Because the boys will shut up and not say anything. So you want to you just open up for, let's talk about tonight. What went well? How could we have done this better? And what did we learn? Then your fourth rule is a spiritual application. <coughs> what can we draw from tonight's activity that could be related to anything spiritual? Boys, and let the boys do the talk. In Alma 30, 44, it says, all things to know there is God. We can find God in anything we do if we're looking for it. And a spiritual reflection, if you end each camping trip with a reflection, each mutual night with a reflection, it will change the tone of your life. We taught the young women how to do this in our work. So every combined activity, before, no matter what we did, before we go home, Whichever group's in charge, the beehives, the deacons, the my mates, the president or designated youth gets up and leads the 70 youth in our ward in a spiritual in a, in a reflection. It's priceless. I wish I could just videotape some of these. Once you've taught the boys how to do this plenty of times, then they conduct the reflection. So let me give you a quick example. I teach a class at BYU where we go canoeing on Utah Lake, among other things. Natural Lake. Very, very scary. We were up in an afternoon big with, with big waves and it took us a while to get inside the jetty there to Provo and I was in my canoe and I was thinking about the reflections. We do this all the time. We teach us how to do it. And I was pointing the front of my boat to this picnic table on the shore that I knew was my, my goal. But the wind was in my face, the big waves, and I was stroking hard and we finally get there. So first rule, immediately. We still have our life jackets on. We're holding our canoe paddles. We haven't moved anywhere. We circle up. He said, what went well, what could have done better, what did we learn? Then I said, okay, let's see if we can get a spiritual application here. I had no idea where this was going. I said, the picnic table on the side, I'm trying to get there through the wind and the waves. What might that represent in a spiritual sense? And one of the young men said, well, that could be the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. If he just said, it's my dad, you know, fishing, you'd say, thank you for that comment. You don't go... That was stupid, that wasn't stupid. No, you just go on to the next thing, okay? Because kids will do this to, to test you. And, and, and a whole spiritual thing can be ruined by you being angry. I've seen that. You've never done it before, right? No, yeah, sure. So then I said, okay, if that's the priesthood in this, in the, or Jesus Christ, what might the wind and waves represent in, the, in this wind in my face? Well, that could be the temptations of Satan, or the, the trials and tribulations of life, and other things. Cool. I had, no way, I had no idea where this was going. So I noticed that I had to stroke hard. If I wasn't stroking hard, the wind and waves would go away. What might that represent? And one of the young ladies said, well, Brother Harris, like, don't you know? That's daily scripture study and prayer. If you do that, you'll make it through the tribulations and you'll find Jesus Christ and, and the principle. Okay, this simple activity, if we had another reflection, we'd all said goodbye, we'd gone home, and if this was a true, our mothers would have said, so how was mutual tonight? Fine. What did you do? We went to Newland, and that's it. We're done. No, we can't do that anymore. The moms need to know what we're doing on our camping trip. They need to know about reflection. And mom needs to be in league with the scoutmaster. So I mean, you're, you've been talking to each other. There's too many moms, I mean, they want things to go. They think that Brother Jones is just doing all these things for the kids. They think it's the boys out playing. 
if we know that every time we leave, we've had a little spiritual reflection, it changes everything. Mom and dad, scoutmaster, and what if the scoutmaster, I know troops who do this, before each camping trip, called one or two moms and said, I'm going to be your son's surrogate dad here for 24 hours. What would you like me to do to bring him closer to Christ during this camping trip? Man, moms would love those phone calls. And then I know of moms who call the scoutmaster and say, you know, very kindly, scoutmaster, I appreciate what you're doing. You're well with my son on this rainy night. Um, you have something planned so that when, when my son comes home, he'll be closer to Christ. I'd rather be the scoutmaster making the phone call than getting the phone call from the mom first. Take the initiative. When I was young men's president, our goal was to beat the young women to everything. Because they were, because they were always better at everything than we were. So our goal was at least keep up with them. I'm not saying it should be competitive, but you should take the initiative. What are we going to do to build faith in Christ? What are we going to do to strengthen the family? I'll be better at two questions. And you can get there by using the reflection. Let me close. A little story. This is one of my favorite places to go to on the Oregon coast. I grew up in Oregon. It's called the Devil's Tournament. And if you've been to California Beach in Southern California, this is not it. Okay? I was just there on Saturday at Huntington Beach. It doesn't look like that at all. Okay? If you fall in there, the only way out is with a rope. And you can't you can't swim out to some little beach. It's straight down rocks, 52 degree water. So this was a long time ago. I was 10 years old. My family was here at the coast having a good time with the tide pools. We knew we'd stay away from that. It's a big sign that says danger highways. And we were eating lunch at my dad's camper, and this sudden knock on the door, this young man said, my girlfriend fell in the tournament. You know, she, she kind of got a starfish, pulled on her leg, and this, this wave came and knocked her in the tournament. And the Forest Service had put a little key there with a the buoy and a rope for that potential purpose, and the young man threw her the buoy, and made mistake number two, he didn't pull on the rope. What was he making, right? So she has the buoy around her in the water. She's not going to drown immediately. The rope is dangling in the surf. The white foam slam over her head. And she's toast. In about a year, in about an hour and a half, the 52 degree water, she's, she's out of here. My dad found this little tiny rope on the side of the camper and a vine, a blanket. And we came down and he tied a bull line knot. You know, finally got it around her and pulled her out. She was all bloody from the rocks. But he saved her life. So if that had happened to your troop, first of all, should have been did. Would you have conducted a reflection? Maybe. Let's talk about it. So tonight, let's just conduct a quick reflection of this event. Let's say that we're we've, we're away from the danger, the waves over there. We just we just or we just got up and looked at it. What might the term represent in a spiritual sense? The devil's term. Say part and make the name for us. I think it's a perfect name. <coughs> What, what might the term represent? This is an open discussion. Adversity and sin. Adversity and sin. Yes, yeah, stay away from the edge. Don't go on the edge. Okay, good. What else? Temptation. Temptation. It could be the temptation in that cold water that just keeps hitting us. It's going to kill us spiritually. Okay, what else? Huh? The world. Yeah. Okay, what might the rope from my dad represent? Or, or, or the blanket that my mom had that we put around the young lady? No. Missionary Atonement. work. What? Missionary work. Missionary work. Yeah, I, I tell the missionaries at the MTC, essentially they're pulling people out of the turn all the time. They don't even know they're in the turn. Uh, the blanket might represent, you know, the, the ward helping nurture people. So these are just little things that it doesn't take a lot of work, but you need to have your antenna spiritually tuned anytime you work with young men. It's not just recreation and going camping and earning back. That's, that's the icing on the cake. The cake is bringing your men to Christ, conducting reflections, having your spiritual intent to pray, working hard to make sure that young men are spiritually tuned and prepared to serve the Say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.